Now, before I welcome Paul to present his findings, I want to share a quick bit of background about him. He is the Isabel and Jerome E. Hyman Distinguished University Professor of Government at the College of William and Mary. He's also an affiliate in the college's public policy program. Before receiving his doctorate in political science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Paul got a grounding in the realities of working in K-12 systems as a social studies teacher and debate coach, teaching at his hometown public high school in the mid-1980s. Since joining the William & Mary faculty in 2003, he's earned a reputation for especially thoughtful work that focuses on the intersection of education policy at multiple levels of government. One of his books, Schools in Federalism and the National Education Agenda, I think is particularly relevant to today's conversation. In it, Paul introduced the concept of borrowing strength. This is the idea that state and federal policymakers can use each other's agendas to advance their own goals, based on both the capacity to act and the license to act. When they borrow capacity or influence from each other, each can get more done. I think borrowing strength is a great way to think about the collaborative effort among principals, district leaders, and state and federal policymakers that it will take to achieve our shared goal, a great principle in every school. And with that, Paul, I'll let you take it away. So many, many thanks for that kind introduction, Will, and thanks uh, to all of you for coming out today. I'm competing against a gorgeous fall afternoon in Washington, D.C., and to see this many people in the room is really, is really great. Um, I also wanted to thank the Wallace Foundation more generally for um, all of their support with this project. It, um, they provided two things that were really, well, three things that were incredibly important. One was the money uh, to do the project. Um, two was the freedom to let us follow the evidence um, where it took us. And then number three uh, was the, the intellect and the smarts to help us make it really the best um, project that it could be. So um, we're really pleased with how it turned out. And it's really um, a credit to the working relationship we had throughout the, the effort. And also want to extend a special thanks to the principals who are here, because ultimately this is really about you. Uh, it's about trying to improve the conditions under which you labor um, and try to help all children. So um, a special uh, thanks to you all for coming here today. What I want to do is to um, begin by walking you through just the basic structure of the report, tell you just uh, in a couple of minutes sort of the overall uh, uh, sort of bit of what's in there, and then we'll dive into a little bit of the details. So there are three main sections, as you can see. Um, we have an opening section that examines principles as just an issue area on education policy agendas. Um, as Will mentioned, there are lots of different issues competing for attention at the state level in education and in other areas. Principles are one of those pieces, and we have some findings that sort of suggest they need to be higher on that agenda than they already are, and we'll talk about that. The second uh, major part of the report looks at some of the specific policy levers that we identified that states could pull if they wanted to try to improve the quality of their principals, to imp improve the, the work of principals already on the job, but also to try to recruit and improve the quality of people coming into the profession. That's the second part of the report, and it's actually sort of the main heart of the report. In addition, though, we thought it was important to talk about this third bit, which is state and local contexts. Um, underscoring the point that every state is different, states are at different points along a spectrum of trying to improve what their principles do. And so before pulling any one lever or combination of levers, it's really important for state policymakers to have an understanding of what the context is in which they are pulling it. Um, a sequence of levers being used in one state may flop that same sequence in another state may succeed given, given the context. And this is a point that we wanted to underscore. Um, probably the most important fine print you will ever read is in the fine print of this slide, um, which is to say what the report is and what it is not. It is a set of considerations. We think there are some great ideas in here for people to think about, some great discussion starters, and some great examples of states already trying to make improvements in policy in this area. Um, but it also is not, and will emphasize this, it's not a prescriptive recipe for success. So there's no five-point plan rolled out over 10 years that will get you to, quote, move the needle on student achievement by some amount. 
you won't find, if this is what you want, you won't find it in here. That's not what this is about. And it's really not the reality of making, the making of state policy in a country as sort of fragmented and diverse as the United States. So before getting to those three points uh, and expanding upon them, I wanted to say something else about the role of uh, localities in particular. So on the cover of the report, we have some pictures of state government buildings, um, but we also importantly have a picture of a principal because ultimately that's where this work has to happen if it's going to improve conditions for, for teachers and students. And so even though the recommendations and the discussion is really targeted at state policy, state levers, et cetera, localities and local officials are key audiences um, for this report as well. So that has a few implications, and they're sort of quickly summarized on the slide. One is that local officials, this report is for you. You see the word state on the cover. You shouldn't just sort of put it to the side. Keep it, keep it close. Um, keep it close to inform your discussion when you go and talk to state officials if you have opportunities to do that, or if you have opportunities to talk to federal officials. This is something that can give you some important uh, points to make as well. State officials, when you convene your task forces and your roundtables and your expert working groups, you better have local people at the table too or you will have missed the point. That's another important uh, reason why the, this is also a report for local uh, folks. And federal officials um, who operate at a, at a distance, you know, at a great distance from state and, uh, state and local levels, also think carefully about localities and states as well when you craft your own recommendations, when you craft your own policies and write your rules and regulations. Think hard. I know it's hard to do that in the rarefied air in Washington, D.C. I walked up the mall to get to the, to the talk today, and the buildings are big, and they really sweep you in, right? I mean, there is something about the place that's really, really amazing. But while we, while we get, get sort, of, uh, sort of sucked up into the environment and the energy that, and all the good that people want to do here, at the national level, remember that all this stuff will not matter unless it plays out well on the ground. So think about the local context when you craft your, your policies at the federal level as well. So with that, let's get into the, those three main parts of the report. I'm going to give you an overview of some of the key um, takeaways. The first is this discussion about principles and the state policy agenda. A few main findings come out of the report, and you'll see these described in detail. Uh, but mainly what we find is that principles as a topic generally are, uh, have a relatively lower priority on state policy agendas, things like common core standards, school turnarounds, accountability, teachers, um, and teacher training. Uh, these kinds of things tend to be the things that, that rise uh, to the top. In particular, when you compare things, com do the comparison with teachers, and we did this in a few different ways, um, looking in, in particular at media coverage uh, of these topics, sort of just in the general popular discussion of education, teachers get a lot more attention than principals do. And similarly in the research literature, which is a place where a lot of policymakers turn for advice about which policies should be tried or enacted, there's less research on uh, principals relative to um, teachers. Now, it makes some sense for this uh, difference. I'm not saying it should necessarily be equal. There are many, many more, more teachers than principals. And um, in the political debate, organizations that represent teachers tend to be more powerful than the ones that represent principals. Nevertheless, we think there is some evidence for, their, for, for arguing that there should be a better balance but, um, in, in attention. And so I'll say a little bit more about that later. Lastly, this point about muddling roles was a really interesting finding that came out after talking with people and doing the research that we did. It is, um, it's almost cliche today to say that um, everybody in the school is, the le is a leader, right, of some sort. The idea of leadership being distributed within a school building. It's not only the principal, but it's the teachers, it's the coaches, the guidance counselors, the volunteers, and in, in some cases, the students themselves serve in leadership roles. This is all good and it should be encouraged, but we think when it comes to policy making, when these things get lumped together and people who write laws or regulations think that, this, that they're writing a policy for leaders and they don't think of the particular roles that principals play, this can wreak havoc on people who actually have to do the job on the ground. And just think for, for a moment, right? We believe that leadership in a school should be distributed, but who convenes the leadership team in the school? It's the principal, right? Who's the one who has a huge say in who the department chair is of the different departments or the different leaders of the different subunits of a school? It's the principal, right? So to think of principals as just any other leader, I think really um, is, a, is, is, a, is a potential problem, especially when those understandings are written in into policy. 
So, so there are lots of, of uh, there's lots of evidence that says principals deserve a higher um, spot on the agenda. Will already highlighted the role of you know the research that we know about the connection between principals and um, and student achievement. We know that principals have a huge role to play in recruiting, training, and also keeping excellent teachers, right? And uh, one of the main reasons why teachers leave a school is because the principals aren't so great. Um, and just the general idea, this, is, this seems like kind of a squishy concept in a world where people are constantly looking at numeric results. But the idea of principals being a key, uh, a key force in, in fostering productive cultures in school. Anybody who has studied any kind of organization, anybody who has ever worked in an organization, which includes everybody in this room, I think, will know that when the culture is no good, the organization is going going to suffer. It's no different in schools. There's a lot of empirical evidence that supports that. So in addition to looking at the agenda, like I said, the heart of the report focuses on six main um, state policy levers. There are lots of other levers that you could might contemplate putting on a list like this. We focused on these because they were most directly related to principals um, themselves, their training, their preparation, and their um, support. Other more general things like the reform of governance, finance, these topics are clearly relevant, but they're a little bit beyond the scope of our focus, which was to try to zero in more in a more specific way on the things that are most relevant for principals. And so, one of the things that we find, and as you, as you read through the report, um, you'll see lots of examples of states trying to use these different levers in different ways, some with some success, some that have struggled. Um, it really underscores the point that states are in a lot of different places on all of these topics. Um, some states are doing really interesting work in some areas, but maybe not so much in other areas. Um, states are at different starting points. They have different political climates and cultures that might make certain levers more, uh, more feasible to pull um, than others. And so the general point to say then is that there's a lot of interesting variation across the country. No state is really excelling in all of these things. Some states are doing some of them very, um, very well though. And those examples we try to highlight in the report. I wanted to mention just a few examples that are in there um, to call your attention to them. We spent a little bit more time going into some depth on these because they thought they were revealing for, for several different reasons. Under the, the point of recruiting, aspiring principals into the profession. One area that one group that we focus on and highlight is a group called the Northeast Leadership Academy, which um, Will mentioned. It's an organization run at North Carolina State University with a particular priority for training um, principals to work in high need uh, rural areas. Um, it underscores an important contextual point that we make in the report as well, that you've got lots of different kinds of communities out in the country, and often if you just were to scan the discussion and the coverage of education policy, reform, principal support and training, there tends to be an urban bias in what we see in the reporting. A lot of Wallace's work actually has been focused on urban areas. That's been one of its main priorities. And we think that's important, but we also thought it was important to highlight an example of a, of a rural oriented institution that is trying to train principals for the specific job of being a principal in a rural um, setting. And so that's the, the Northeast Leadership Academy um, that's, that's highlighted in there. A second um, uh, set of examples that are highlighted, we give you not only some narrative, but also a timeline that's in the back of the report, is on overseeing um, principal preparation programs. Here we talk about a couple of cases, um, Illinois and Kentucky, where both states have, have made uh, great efforts over a long period of time to try to improve how principals are prepared um, in the programs that they, that they enter. A few things stand out about these, um, these, uh, these two states. One is that they actually share a border. That, I didn't realize that until the Wallace staff alerted me to that. So there actually is a tiny border that Illinois and Kentucky share. So that, maybe for Jeopardy facts, that'll help some of you. Um, anyways, I thought that was interesting. Uh, but more importantly, and to the point of what we're talking about, um, is that both states, if you look at the timeline that's in the back of the report, both states undertook efforts that took basically more than a decade to come to fruition, okay? So the quick fix, the quick po passage of policy, get it out into the field, change things really in a, in a swift manner. This is not what they did. And the, our prediction is that this will bode well for their success. Illinois has already won an award um, for its work, um, uh, for example. What's fascinating about this, these two cases is if you think about a decade or more of time, 
uh, that does not line up with anybody's political calendar, right? Politicians think in terms of two and four year time frames usually. And so what it means is the work in Kentucky and Illinois it, it was able to cut across numerous election cycles, numerous changes of administration, yet somehow still had the momentum to, um, to keep moving, um, moving forward. I'm gonna not say anything more about it. You can read the details in the report to, to see some of the reasons why we think, um, we think these are two exemplar cases. We also thought it was important to talk about um, some work that is still um, taking shape. And so under the example of licensing principles, we decided to take a look a little bit more uh, deeply at uh, Massachusetts. Um, Massachusetts has adopted a new approach um, called the Massachusetts Performance, Performance Assessments for Leaders, or the MAPAL um, system. What the state is trying to do, and it's roll, it, it was in a pilot phase last year and it's rolling out this year, what the state is trying to do is to create licensing experiences for principals that are linked more directly to the actual practices that principals do um, in their day-to-day -day work in schools. And so licensing is, is, they're trying to make it more than simply uh, sort of a check the box exercise. Does the person have the right number of years of experience? Did they attend the right program? Do they have the right classes? Did they pass the licensing test at some level? Check. Now you're a principal. There's an attempt to really build in some real world um, working experiences into the licensing process. Nobody really knows if this will work. It's a shift. It's going to cost some money to do this. Um, it'll involve a lot more people than just running a bunch of Scantron tests through a principal licensing exam um, uh, machine. But um, it's something to pay attention to. And we'll see, it'll be fascinating to see how the state moves forward, how it adjusts, how it learns. Um, and we'll see what other states might be able to learn uh, from it. Let me talk about the context next in which all of these things um, play out. Uh, this is one very important reason why the word considerations is in the title of the report. Uh, we think that's the right word because these are ideas to consider. How a state uses these ideas really will depend a lot on these different contexts. Uh, four contexts are discussed in depth. There's a governance context, which involves the diverse array of institutions that have some say in how policy is made and how it's carried out in states. Lots of states are different. Attention federal policymakers. Not every state has the same array of agencies, boards, and other organizations that implement the policies that you pass across the street. Important point to note. Um, the diversity of locales in which students uh, students learn, principals do their work, and teachers teach. This is this cuts across lots of different dimensions. We have rural, urban, we have suburban, we have we have communities that have high concentrations of immigrant students, more um, uh, uh, who have more uh, sort of English as a as a second language type needs. Lots of different diversity in locales. Capacity of agencies to do this work. Some are very high capacity. Some are very low capacity. Interestingly, in some states, if you pay any attention to this, you'll notice that many urban school systems are higher capacity than the state agencies with whom they work, which creates interesting dynamics as well. So capacity is highly, highly varied. And then finally is this um, prevailing sort of uh, web of policies and practices that bear on principles. And we thought an important context to think about was the context of the principal's office. Um, so when a principal comes to work each and every day, there are lots of different policies that intersect, lots of different demands that fall on principals. And so a common view that we have these days is that, principal, that, that principal, being a principal is not really about managing. Um, it's really about being an instructional leader. It's about taking teachers and helping them to meet the, the academic needs of their students, right? Um, that's really what the job of the principal is. The principal's job, as many reports and other people often will say, the principal's job has been transformed, right? This is a common thing that you hear. Um, we disagree with that formulation. Um, we think the principal's job is very different than it was, but we think principals still do a lot of managing in buildings, and if you think they don't, um, here's a, here are some results that are on page 49 in the report. Um, we're looking here at the percentage of principals reporting a great deal or major influence over a set of certain tasks, going back to surveys. These are, this is the federal schools and staffing survey going back to the 1980s up to the present. If the principal's job has been transformed, it's stunning to me that they spend this much time on budgeting and setting school discipline policy and the HR function of hiring their teachers, right? 
in-service teacher training, you could maybe argue that has some connection to the, to the focus of, of, of increasing student achievement. But if it really is a brand new job, then these kinds of things, it, it seems like there's a mismatch. So what we really think is going on is that there's, this, there's a layering, there's a sort of an adding up of responsibilities for principals, and these things bear down hard on the shoulders of, of remember, of human beings um, trying to do this job. Uh, so where does that leave us? We have some, uh, some questions for discussion at the end of the report. Um, it's a long report. There aren't many bumper stickers in it, but I thought I would end with just a few bumper stickers that you could take home when you have two minutes in an elevator with a powerful person and you want to try to move them to think more carefully about this position. Um, one is this idea that principals are powerful multipliers of effective teaching. Um, the important implication is in supporting principals, you're not having some sort of zero-sum battle with other priorities. In fact, I would argue that none of the state's priorities will succeed unless they have excellent principals leading in buildings. If you think Common Core is going to work and teachers are really going to change their practice without excellent principals, then I think you are living in a dreamland. Um, that's number one. Um, number two, policy is as practice does. What this basically means is that policy is not what's written down on a paper after a legislature passes it or an agency writes a rule. Policy is what people do in the classroom and in the school every single day. Now certainly it's influenced by what's written down on the paper, but the actual policy is what is embedded in the practice. And so think about those ground level realities when you write, um, when you write policy. And lastly, a question that I think many principals ask when they go to work every day is which laws will I need to break today in order to lead my school? Right? <laughs> the point being, in any given day, many laws will conflict. So it's a matter of which, which law on which day is the one that gets broken. So the implication is, before you pull any new levers, before you adopt any grand new um, five or 10 year plans, a smart, the smart money would bet on pausing for a moment Take stock of what is already on the books. Take stock of what you are already asking principals to do. And then before you demand that they do three new things, propose that there are six things that they no longer need to do. And this will probably help everybody out, um, students, teachers, and principals in the long run. Um, with that, let me say thank you very much for your attendance, and I look forward to the conversation. <laughs>